So I'm trying to promote a, a perception of things so that we do not separate the, uh, the final result deed of the flesh from the cause of that deed, which is a, a spiritual issue or motion that was conceived in the heart and comes forth out of the heart into the flesh and then produces a deed or an action or something that's manifested for others to see. And this is the whole essence of God being magnified and glorified or the devil being magnified or glorified. Mystery of godliness, greatest mystery of godliness, God was manifested in the flesh. And so consequently, as we say, mystery of iniquity, although the scripture doesn't say this explicitly, you know you would follow through. The mystery of iniquity is going to be uh, the devil or sin manifested in the flesh. And, uh, you know, for time, it, it is a mystery to us how this is done. But eventually, the mystery is, is sort of taken away. God reveals it to us. Okay, he reveals it. The, the things that are revealed belong to us. Okay, God, it is a mystery at the onset, but the mystery is revealed. Eventually, the mystery of iniquity is revealed. Iniquity is discovered. The counsel of God brings illumination. We understand. And that is how the truth makes you free. And if you shall know the truth, the truth will make you free. And if you shall be free, you shall be free indeed. You'll be completely free, totally free. And we talked of that liberty and that freedom in terms of the exercise of your will, right? The exercise of your will. We may come back to that. But, uh, so we don't want to separate this whole process of events, starting with the heart, what's in the heart, what proceeds out of the heart, into the flesh, producing a deed or an action. And that deed or action is what last week we explicitly defined as the fruit, the final fruit. By their fruits you shall know them. By their works and actions and deeds shall you know them. Even though you're not saved by works, or you're not saved by the works of the law, you, you must follow on and, and expound the purpose of God so that you know that, yes, you're not saved by singular self-willed efforts to keep a standard or a law that's been dictated to you by letter or by some external standard that's been put upon you where you have no no full understanding of that because the righteousness of God must come from within. That's the goal. It must come from within. For from within, out of the heart. And we'll go into that scripture. So you have people, you have a, a perception in Christianity like, well, the inner thoughts and the uh, spiritual sins and the iniquity and the uh, motivations of the heart, uh, that's, that's what's wicked. What comes out in the flesh is something totally different and uh, God doesn't care about that or that doesn't have the significance. What's really wicked is what's, if, if you have iniquity and rebellion and everything in your heart, these outward uh, manifestations in your body, and are not that important. They are, they are mocked. They are uh, belittled, if you will. And you're going to find out through this council that God does not put any such separation like that in this whole working. For God to be glorified, you have to produce the image of Christ in the flesh. And that is in all holiness. And that is all purity. Having, beloved, these precious promises, let us per, uh, cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and the spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. So holiness and purity and perfection have to do with the heart and the flesh. Now it starts with the heart. You hypocrites, cleanse first the inward part because the outward part doesn't matter. No, cleanse the inward, that the outward may appear clean, pure, holy also. There you go, amen. So this is the whole point. I'm, I'm just going to uh, further strengthen that whole perception. Uh, a scripture that I've preached, and I'm going to generalize it a bit more. Maybe it's sort of a different context, not really. 
Uh, anyway, you've all heard me say this before, but I'm going to put it in context with this idea now. Uh, in Matthew 23, it's, you know, it's, it's Jesus' stinging rebuke to the Pharisees and the scribes. And by the way, unless your righteousness exceed the righteousness of the Pharisees, you're not going to enter into the kingdom of heaven. Right. Now, they were pretty good living guys. Yeah. They, were, they were known as pretty strict, moral, outwardly, law-keeping, all of that. See, so we have to go above that? Well, how can we do that? The only way you can do it is let the righteousness of Christ, His divine nature, have access to your body and you continually yield to that. You continually yield to that. That's the only one who can exceed the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees is the divine nature. But that's quite a standard, isn't it? It's like I always say, you know, how do I enter eternal life? Well, keep the commandments, which, and he begins to quote them all, you know, don't swear, don't, uh, don't uh, bear false witness, don't covet, don't commit adultery, no, no, no. all these I've kept from my youth up, what do I lack yet? So, Jesus, Jesus, the man who, who brought uh, grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. You want to call Paul the premier apostle of grace? Well, how about Jesus? He would be a cut above Paul, wouldn't he? Absolutely. And here's the guy ministering grace saying, what do you got to do to be saved? You got to keep the commandments. Like I, you've heard me say it recently. Not only do you keep the commandments, but you also have to exceed, except your righteousness, you have to exceed the fulfillment of the law. You got to sell everything you have. You got to lay down your whole life. You got to pick up your cross. You have to get, uh, take up uh, a life of things that are going to be reproach and sufferings. The captain of our salvations is, is made perfect through what? Through suffering. See, so it's more than just law. It's law plus a whole lot, plus more. So people think that grace is slack. Oh, grace is slack. God did away with the law, so we're not under the law anymore. We're free. We're free. Doesn't matter what we do. It's all covered. It's all under the blood and all that. Nonchalant, non-caring, you know, attitude towards holiness and purity, especially towards the outward expression of it. But that is, is equally important. See, we're not going to be able to separate it like that in our perception. And so for that, I go to uh, Matthew 23, and he says to the uh, Pharisees, you blind guys, you say, whosoever shall swear by the temple, it's nothing. Whosoever shall swear by the gold of the temple, he is a debtor. <laughs> you fools and blind, what's greater, the gold or the temple that sanctifies the gold? And whosoever shall swear by the altar, it's nothing. Whosoever shall swear by the gift upon it, he is guilty. So clearly, the perception of the Pharisee was they're placing this importance on the, uh, the gift on the altar and giving no importance to the altar itself. Yeah. The altar is nothing. We're just concerned about the gift. Yeah. The temple is nothing. Don't worry about the temple. It's nothing. It's insignificant. We're, we're only swearing by the gold that's in the temple. Yeah. Well, what's the gift in you? It's the Holy Ghost, isn't it? No, what's the gold? Is it not, that, not the divine nature that's in you, the gold? They're saying, oh, it's just the spiritual substance inside of you that's important. The temple. Now, what's the temple? You are the temple of the Holy Ghost. What's the altar? You're the altar. If God's going to sacrifice the life of Jesus Christ to this world in our generation, what altar is he going to put it on? An altar of wood? Does the Most High dwell in buildings made with hands? Is the altar of our age of, and dispensation of grace, is our altar some kind of wooden, po wooden podium? And God's going to torch us or something? No, our, our, our altar is the flesh. That's what the life of Christ is offered on, on your flesh. So what does Jesus say? You're fools and you're blind if you try to take this perception and, and, and chop it in half and try to divorce the flesh from the spirit and the spirit from the flesh and say the heart, the issue of the heart is one thing and the issue of the flesh is another. You're a fool if you think like that. You're a fool. Yeah. What's, what's more important, the altar, uh, the, the uh, gift, or the altar that sanctifies the gift? And so... Contrary to Pharisee thinking and religious 
spirit thinking and grace perverted thinking who, who thinks that the altar or the flesh or the temple has very little significance and it's what's inside. Contrary to that, Jesus is actually making the point that, that the, the altar is the thing that sanctifies the gift. It has more relevance and importance to transmitting the glory of God into the world than the actual Holy Ghost does. Now, I'm not saying the flesh is more greater than the Holy Ghost. What I'm saying is you can have the gift of the Holy Ghost and Christ can dwell in your hearts by faith, but if he never comes out into your flesh, nobody sees him. He is, he's buried, exactly, you buried the talents. You hid it in the earth. You didn't follow through to perfection. You didn't let that Holy Ghost come out. You didn't put on the wedding garment. And God is not glorified in the world through you. Remember what we've heard preached? Christ in you is the hope of glory. Christ in us is the only uh, avenue God has to glorify the image of Christ into the world. It has to take place through the body. Right? Because no man can come to God except through Jesus Christ. Well, where is Jesus Christ, the head of the body? He's in heaven. So who, who on earth is, is here to relay, transmit, manifest, show the image of Jesus Christ to the world? Who's left? We are. We're the body. Amen. So the altar sanctifies the gift. The temple sanctifies the goal. <coughs> so you're an altar. I'm an altar. You're a temple. I'm a temple. The gold in your temple is the Holy Ghost. The gold in my temple is the Holy Ghost. The gift that's in me is the Holy Ghost. And I'm the altar. The altar sanctifies the gift. Now, the motivation that we get to sanctify the Lord comes through the Word. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy Word is truth. So you hear the Word of God and you say, Wow, it is very, very vital and we have a responsibility to work out our salvation to the point where the very divine nature of God takes control of and we yield our members to his spirit. Otherwise, there's no expression of God or his glory into the earth. That's how important it is for us to be sanctified. So we seek to sanctify ourselves when we hear that truth. That motivates us to sanctify ourselves. Well, what do you mean by sanctify yourself? You separate yourself from anything that would hinder the process of this happening. As the process is described to you, the operation of God. We're saved through faith in the operation of God. And we can go, we've talked all about that enough in the, in the past. But, um, so how, and so how can you say the altar is nothing, but the gift is important? Right? It, it is important. You, you can't say, uh, uh, I, I have no regard for any individual at all. I, I'm just led by the Holy Ghost and I'm my own entity, right? So, and I don't care about anything else. No, you, we have to know who each other are. God's Spirit bears witness with each other's spirit that we are the children of God. I need a witness that you're my brother. You need a witness that I'm, I'm your brother. Well, you get the idea. If you swear by the altar, you swear by it and by all things thereon. Whoso shall swear by the temple, swear by it and by him that dwelleth therein. And who's dwelling in the temple? The Holy Ghost. Yeah. And he that shall swear by heaven, sweareth by the throne of God and by him that sitteth thereon. Won't you, scribes, Pharisees, hypocrites, you pay tithe of mint and anise and cumin and have omitted the weightier matters of the law, judgment, mercy, and faith. These ought you, ye have to have done and not to leave the other undone. Okay, I'm going to kind of pass the context there. So I'll start there. So one thing preaching of the Word of God does is it keeps putting us in remembrance. It imparts unto us the knowledge of God. And the knowledge of God is directly linked to the fear of the Lord. In Isaiah 6, I think it is, or 9, 6. The spirits of God, the spirit of knowledge and fear of the Lord. And in simplicity, if you don't know anything about God, what is there to fear? 
He's just the possibility of some spiritual entity out there. You don't know what he's like, what he likes or doesn't like. You don't know what his intentions are. But if you know his intentions is he's going to destroy man that he's created, you know, like in the days of Noah. You know, Noah really didn't have opportunity to fear God until God came on the scene and said, Noah, you have I seen righteous, and Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord, and I'm going to destroy man whom I've created, and that's an awesome thing. That's a fearful thing. What did it motivate him to do? Sanctify himself. Stop doing what he was doing with his life and devote himself to building the ark. That's sanctification, separating yourself onto the process of going into perfecting purity and holiness. And sancti that's sanctification, set apart. So um, this requires exercise. It requires um, bringing to remembrance. It requires diligence. Um, I'll go into uh, the word diligence for a while. Uh, and s while I try to figure out where to how to measure this whole idea out, keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. I quoted this last week. Everything starts in your heart. It's out of your heart that the issues or the motions of spirit come forth out of your heart. Now we're going to go further with that today and go to the book of James and talk about. How the spirit, how a particular spirit is formed in your heart in the first place. Okay, so just keep that in mind. Um, so we have to give diligence. That's one thing. Diligence. And diligence and discipline and words like that are related. Discipline means disciple. And it's uh, discipline in and of itself isn't going to do the job by itself, but it's a means to an end. It's a part of, of how you can keep yourself prepared and uh i don't know you uh, diligence is something that's gonna help prepare you for a process that god wants to bring us through you'll be renewed in the spirit of your mind take every thought into captivity we're gonna find out why that's so important because the whole thing begins with a thought the whole thing begins with a thought Remember, we're going to talk about a process that starts with a thought in the heart and it, it um, progresses into more and more things that eventually end up as fruit or as a work or a deed or an action, which constitutes fruit, as we've been saying all along, constitutes fruit. So, so don't uh, divorce or don't separate the... Uh, importance of what's in the heart from the importance of what comes out in the flesh it is all one big flowing process and motion that that has a beginning and an end and there's nothing you, you should never perceive of it in a separated way because what we're going to find out is like by their fruits that means by the deed and the action it becomes a uh, indicator a manifestation you follow it right back into where it came from it came from a spirit which came into the flesh that spirit was yielded to where did that spirit come from that spirit came from within the heart how did that spirit get in the heart it started with a thought and with a let's say an interaction with that thought and we're going to see all of that so this involves the thoughts, it involves temptation, it involves whether we regard the iniquity in our hearts or not, or whether we take the thoughts captive and make it obedient to Christ in the place where, where you and I want to do battle and give diligence is where the whole process begins, in the thoughts. Just hang on to that for a minute. Simon Peter, a servant, apostle of Jesus Christ, of them that have obtained like precious faith with us through the righteousness of God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. According as his divine power hath given us all things that pertain unto life and godliness. Through the knowledge of him that hath called us to glory and Virtue, that's purity, that's nobleness and purity of intention. Now don't tell me anybody who manifests vile deeds in their flesh and who practices sin and iniquity with deliberation and excess 
Don't tell me there's virtue in their intentions. That's the whole point we made in Psalm 32, was it? Blessed is the man whose sin is covered, whose transgression is hidden, whatever, to uh, whom the Lord will not impute iniquity, who has virtue because he does no guile, and whose spirit is no guile. As soon as you, as soon as you are practicing guile and deceit and secrecy and deliberate provision and excess of sinning with, with conscious knowing it and doing it because you like it, and for prolonged periods of time, you no longer qualify for Psalm 32. Your iniquity is, is marked. It is imputed. It's marked. It's noted. It's slated. You're being planned uh, for judgment or whatever. Chastisement, scourging, whatever. Damnation. Who, who knows how dark the heart is? Uh, we don't know. God knows the hearts. All right, so all things that pertain unto life and godliness. Do you think that's just godly thoughts? Do you think that's just some godly sense of faith within and it doesn't matter how that follows through into the flesh? No, all godliness. All godliness. Through the knowledge of him that hath called us to glory and virtue, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious <laughs> promises, that by these you might be partakers of the divine nature. The divine nature. So we're going to talk about nature. What is nature? Nature is something that you do kind of automatically, habitually, without deliberating about it. It's, it is a nature. It is a natural thing that simply flows through you, out into you, and you practice something by nature. It's automatic. No one has to tell you how to do it. You don't need a law to tell you how to do it. If you do something by nature, you do it automatically. That's what the Bible means. Is that Christ, they are Christ. They're not under the law. They don't need some kind of standard or someone to keep telling them to do it, telling them to do it, because they're going to do it anyway. They're going to do it by nature. It's going to be something that comes from within them. The righteousness of God that comes from within them. Keep your heart. Out of it are the issues of spirit that will naturally going to do something in your flesh. So... Whereby, the, by these you might be partaker of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. And beside this, giving all, what? Giving all what? Diligence. Diligence. Will you add to your faith? Now we first believe in Christ, we have faith. Faith is not of yourself, it's the gift of God. We exercise faith, we have faith, we respond to God by faith. We come to the Lord by faith. We forsake our old life and our old world uh, to sanctify ourselves by faith because it came by the knowledge of God. We believe the knowledge of God. It was preached to us. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. The word of God was preached to us. It, it conceived in us. We believed it and we responded and we began to sanctify and separate ourselves from our old lifestyle and our old deeds. Uh, giving all diligent adds to your faith. What do you add to your faith? Virtue. You must add virtue to your faith. Now, I've heard it quoted uh, many a times. Add to your faith knowledge. Add to your faith knowledge. And I guess, you know, as a matter of general principle, I guess that could, that could pass. Because you, you, you want to add to your faith knowledge. But what if you miss the virtue? <laughs> no, you can take the knowledge of God and use it unknowledgeably. The prosperity preachers take the principles of the word of God and deceive by appealing to people's covetousness. And when the Bible talks about the people of God in the wilderness, they asked for meat in their lust. lust. Meat, meat. We want meat for our lust. We want, we, want, uh, we want material prosperity. We want God to give us houses and cars and good jobs and good things in this life. And that's asking for meat. The prosperity preachers are like the people in the wilderness asking meat for their lust. They don't want some dull, dragged out, dull, boring life. They want God to give them the abundant life. You heard it. 
Oh, I've come that they might have life and have it more abundantly. But for us, the abundant life is the abundance of holiness and purity. The abundant life is the eternal life. It's nothing in this life. Because the scriptures never bear out that God's supposed to give us a good life in this life. Never does it bear that out. Sell all you have. Sell all you have. God's loving kindness is to afflict us and make us perfect through sufferings. And the Bible says God, the, God's loving kindness is better. It's better. It's better. It's better than life in this life. And then finally, you know, I quote Psalm 70, 73 all the time. Who are the prosperity preachers? They want goodness and riches in this life. Behold, these are the ungodly. They prosper in the world they increase in riches never heard that from a prosperity preacher and you never will because you can't get any of their counsel past that well anyway here we go you have to have virtue after you have faith see what are they doing they're taking the knowledge of god and they're perverting it the people in the wilderness uh that got quail god gave them the quail God gave Kenneth Copeland a billion, $1.3 billion. Yeah. But none of those people entered the promised land. None of them. None of them. A rich man is not going to enter the kingdom of God. And how did they get all their riches? Why, an east wind blew in the quail. Be not deceived with every wind of... You don't say. So you're telling me God blew in a, a doctrine of prosperity their way based on the word of God and they preach it? And man, they had so many quail, they were they didn't know what to do with it all. What's Come Kenneth out. Copeland got to do with 1.3? Well, so you add to your faith virtue and after having given all diligence so this is what we got to do we do have to give diligence to this diligence meaning a constant um effort of yeah a constant uh degree a high degree of continual effort continuing all the time diligence you know uh, sticking to it and, and all that that means in terms of our godly exercise seeking the lord it would mean you know, reading the Bible, praying and studying your circumstances and continuing in faith and fellowship as a body and whatever exercise is involved in the exercise of gifts or calling or what have you. All of that is giving diligence. So you add to your faith virtue and to virtue knowledge because if you get knowledge and you already have virtue, then you're going to use the knowledge of God for perfecting the saints and the perfection of yourself. And you add to knowledge temperance to temperance patience. patience to patience godliness to godliness brotherly kindness to brotherly kindness charity for these things be in you and abound they make you that you shall be neither barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our lord jesus christ but he that lacketh these things is blind cannot see afar off and has forgotten that he was purged from his old sins now, I take that now after everything I've seen over the last 10 years or so, or 15 years. If you forget, don't forget, you were purged from your past sins. I think this goes beyond just an issue of your conscience, feeling free in your conscience. You're purged from your old sins. You don't have to obey them. Right. You, have, you have people actually walking, living in, and doing the deeds of sins that, that they were in when they were first saved. And then many, many, many years later, they're still practicing those sins. No, you forgot. You were purged of those sins. What's the scripture in Ezekiel? He said, I purged you. God said, I purged you, and you were not purged. Right. You know, there's a generation, they're clean in their own sight, but they're not washed from their filthiness mm -hmm. because they're still practicing the same deeds. Uh, there's a generation uh, that think they're clean and think that they're washed, I think that they're clean, but they're not washed from their filthiness. That's chiefly because of, of a perception that cleanly cleanness in the sight of God is only an issue of the heart and not an issue of what comes out in your natural body. And never should we separate our perception. Again, I'll say it 
a dozen times maybe. You don't, you don't separate that. You can't say the altar is nothing. It's the gift that's important. You, don't, you, you can't say any of that. It's not true on the side of righteousness and it's not true on the side of unrighteousness. Okay? It's like the mystery of iniquity is, is, is iniquity or Satan manifested in the flesh. So the unclean issue of the heart comes forth and makes it, produces an unclean act. Wherefore the rather, brethren, give diligence to make your calling and election sure, for if you do these things you shall never fall, and so an abundant entrance shall be given to you. Um, we are partakers of the divine nature. So there was some guy, I don't know his name was, uh, I don't know what his name was, Simon something or other. And it's not a scripture, but it's a, a progression of thought. It's a saying he came up with. I, I think he was a preacher of some sort or a philosopher. I don't know who he was, but anyway, here's how it goes. Sow a thought, you know, sow as in sowing a seed, right? Sow a thought and you reap an action. You start with a thought, and it ends up with a action. That's a singular deed, if you will. Right? Oh, my thought is, gee, I'm thirsty. I'd like a cup of coffee. That's the thought. And what do I reap? An action. I go pour myself a cup of coffee, and I actually drink it. Okay. So in action, you reap a habit. So a habit, and you reap a character or a nature, something that's done automatically. And you sow a character, you keep sowing to that character, you will reap your destiny. Now that's good, or well, that's evil. And it's not a bad way to perceive things as a progression or sequence of events. Now, from that, let's go back to the scripture of um, James. James, the servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, the twelve tribes just scattered abroad, greeting, my brethren, count it all joy when you find, fall into diverse temptations. When Jesus was baptized by John, the Holy Ghost came upon him, and then what happened? Immediately he was driven or led you know, one account says led, one says driven, into the wilderness to be tempted. Tempted, tempted by who? Tempted the by the devil. Mm -hmm. And the devil is going to try to appeal to your lust. He's going to appeal to your lust, your want, your state of want. Mm -hmm. Count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations, testings. God is proving us. Lord God has come down now to prove you before his, before his face that his fear may be upon you that you sin not. What do you suppose that sin not meant there? Just have a thought of unbelief? Or does it mean that, that you sin not? We spent last week saying sin and sins, is uh, they're, they're mostly interchangeable. There's no real distinction there for the most part, maybe in a few places. But for the most part, you know, just like you say there's 10 deer in the field, you could say, look at all those deer. And you say, see one deer in the field, you say, well, look at that deer. So if I can commit a bunch of sins, uh, if I sin, I'm committing acts of sins. <laughs> or you want to, it, it, it goes like that. There's no distinction there. Now, so count it joy when you fall into divers temptations, knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. But let patience have a perfect work that you may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. Yeah, we have to be tried, tested, especially after we receive the Holy Ghost. God is going to prove us. Lead us this 40 years or whatever, this lifetime in the wilderness, the wilderness of sin, it's even called in the Old Testament, the wilderness of sin, to prove you, to see what's in your heart, to see whether you love the Lord your God or knows. Now, how in the world does God know what's in your heart? Well, He knows the heart, but what's the ultimate manifestation of God knowing what's in your heart? 
And whether you'll be obedient, what you do, what you do, the act and deed that you commit. So much so, so much so that even when the cry of Sodom and Gomorrah came up before God and their sin waxed great before the Lord, God didn't say, ah, I know their hearts, I know they're wicked. No, God did not base it simply what was in their heart on what was simply what was in their heart. He says, I will go down now and I'm going to test and prove and see whether it's altogether according to the cry of it or not. And if it is, I will know it. So God came down. What did he do? He came down. Abraham, uh, God, the Lord came down with two men and appeared to Abraham. And then further you go on, and then the man, the Lord was not with the two angels, but the two angels went into Sodom and Gomorrah to see firsthand the expression, the deeds, the actions, the character, the nature, the image that was being produced by the deeds of the flesh of the Sodomites. And they they experienced an example of it. Bring these two men out that we may know them. Then, then they knew. See, even God did not rely on simply a witness of knowing what's within, but the fullness had to be expressed and revealed and made known before God could righteously execute the judgment. I'll go down now and I'll see. Well, that's what God's doing with us, His Spirit's in us. And here we are in this world of Sodom, so to speak. This religious pollution where God calls his own polluted church Sodom and Gomorrah. And here we are. And, and, and we, are, we are like the angels and we're experiencing and registering and experiencing and perceiving the deeds that are going on around us. All right? It must need that the scripture be fulfilled. God knew about the iniquity of the Amorites. Why doesn't God just say, oh, I see the iniquities in their heart. I'm going to judge them. No, because the iniquity of the Amorites was not yet full. It had not become a full expression and deeds in their body and their in their flesh. Right? I can see, I can know the heart of my little kid. I can just look at his face and say, I, I no one has to tell me he's 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 fixing to sneak a cookie out of that cookie jar. I know his heart. I'm his dad. I know his heart. No one has to tell me. If I spank him before he steals the cookie, for his sake I shouldn't do that. Because he's not gonna understand. Oh, what did I do? I didn't do anything. And he's just a kid. He's not going to understand. I got to let the iniquity come to the full, right? I got to let him sneak, take the lid off, put his hand in there. Then I show up. The iniquity's full. Here it is, expressed. Right? Now I can execute judgment. That, that's how God it has to come to a full. Everything has to, has to finish off as a manifestation in the flesh. Everything has to be fulfilled. Like I say, you can have a cry in your heart and that's good and God knows the cry of your heart. Well, God knows the cry of my heart and then there's nothing wrong with it. Yeah, God knows the cry of your heart. But somewhere, like I was preaching before, Psalm 77, I cried unto the void, uh, I cried unto the Lord, what? With my spirit. I cried unto the Lord, what? With my thoughts. With my voice. And then he heard me. Now God knows the cry in my heart, but there's something got to be fulfilled where my conflict my struggle, my temptation, climaxes in a desperation where I cry unto the Lord with my voice. And then he hears me. It's got to be fulfilled. Amen. It can't just remain as some kind of latent, inbred sort of intention and maybe it'll get around to fulfilling it. Maybe it'll come out my flesh and maybe it won't. You see how important the flesh is? The flesh has to express it, something. If it's in the heart, it's going to come out, and the flesh has to express it. What's more important? Jesus says, you fools and you blind, the altar sanctifies the gift. The altar is so important. The flesh is so important. It's the only thing going to manifest the image of God into the world. The only way that the image of Jesus Christ is going to be glorified is through your body, your flesh. The body's not for fornication. The body is for the Lord, don't tell me the flesh is nothing. The flesh has no importance. Altar is nothing. It's the gift. It's the all these sins of the flesh. You all try to pick at me for the sins of my flesh. All the fleshly lusts are nothing. 
And you hear all that all the, from people all the time. They try to separate the two. Here you're going to find out you God never separates it. It's all one continuing progressive work that glorifies God or glorifies the devil. Bible, you, you try to try to categorize and make a distinction between uh, godly lusts and fleshly lusts. It's so blind, so blind, you, you just ignore the simplest scriptures that say, abstain from fleshly lusts that war against your soul. You got people saying, oh, when you have illegitimate sex, or if you steal a chocolate bar, or you steal a car, or you, or if you do this, or do that, or you, or you, or you cheat your boss out of money at work, and if you do all that stuff, all these fleshly deeds... Um, that's just the deed of the flesh. Jesus took care of all that. That doesn't matter. And I, I always said, if you think adultery is a sin of the flesh or a deed of the flesh, then how come Jesus says, nothing entering without into a man defiles a man, but that which comes out of a man that which comes out of a man. That's what defiles the man. Makes him impure, unholy, ungodly. Not sanctified and not holy. What comes up out of a man. For from within, out of the heart of man. Out of the heart proceed the issues. Out of the heart of man. Out of the heart proceed the spiritual movements and motions. Out of the heart of man proceed. Out of the heart of man proceeds. Adultery. Fornication. Witchcraft. Hatred. Variance. Emulation. Wrath. Strife. Blasphemy. Evil eye. Pride. Blasphemy. Foolishness. So if, if all these things are a sin of the flesh, or some of these things are a sin of the flesh... Why did Jesus describe them as coming out from your heart? Do you understand? Adultery is not a sin of the flesh. Adultery is a sin of the heart. It is a work of the flesh, but it is a sin of the heart. So the fleshly lust is a sin of your heart. Amen. And why would we yield ourselves to a sin of the uh, like that, a deed of, of flesh like that? Unless there's something about God's word we do not believe. Last week I focused and, and pinpointed and characterized the fundamental sin that begins or finally contributes or... Uh, Results in the searing of the conscience. You shall not surely die. That's a lie. Yeah. If you do these things, the Bible says, you will surely die. They which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Well, so if you do some kind of thing that you say is a sin of the flesh... And specifically, some kind of whatever, adultery or stealing or whatever it is, doing drugs or getting drunk. Or... What finally emboldens your conscience and gives you some kind of uh, perverted clearness to do that? It's something that you don't believe about the seriousness of God. So, you can call it a sin of the flesh if you want, but if you commit it, you know you can you can call that a sin of the flesh you want and try to say that's sins and that the singular sin is some kind of uh, state of unbelief. But the truth is, if you commit the sins, the actions, then you've already committed the sin of unbelief beforehand, because you cannot do that with a clear conscience without casting off something you've heard about the Word of God and not believing it. Again, you cannot separate the two. An action and a deed of sin is some kind of manifestation of unbelief, especially for the Christian or the seasoned Christian or the person who has the Holy Ghost, who's tasted the Word of God, and people like us who have been in Christianity for a long time. All right, so, so kind of joy when you fall into diverse temptations 
trying of your faith works patience. And uh, patience, let her have it, have it, your perfect work, so you may be perfect and entire. So, we, yeah, we are in a warfare. Brother Stan's playing these Milton Green messages, and I think it was Milton Green, if I'm not mistaken, who said, yeah, it was him, who said, the Bible doesn't say ignore the devil and he'll free, flee from you. It says resist the devil. Temptation comes and you have to put on the front back a warfare in your mind with wise counsel make your war. He's going to try to... to uh, belittle and poo-poo away the consequences of sin and embolden you to commit an action and a deed based on your lust and your wants. He's going to try to get that to work in you and he wants you to pay attention to it long enough so that it grows into a, a, a spiritual movement, a spiritual motion that gets momentum as you keep regarding it. It keeps getting uh, gaining momentum and gaining a momentum until... You, you can't withstand the motion of it anymore. You know, it'd be like a, a car slowly creeping down the uh, driveway with a very small grade on it because someone left it in neutral. If the car is slow enough, you can you could conceivably stop that motion. You could resist it. But if you leave it too long and, this car, and the car starts going faster and faster and faster and faster and faster down the hill in neutral... You're going to get to a point where you can't resist it anymore. You try to, and it bowls you over. All right. You want to ha let patience have her perfect work, so you're entire wanting nothing. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask God, and give it who gives to all men liberally and upbraideth not, and it shall be given him. Well, we want to make wise, use wise counsels to make our warfare. And this is some of the counsel that we're, we're delivering now. We're, you know, we are magnifying the fear of God, the, the importance of the flesh, the glorifying of God, how we, we don't want to fail of the grace of God to produce righteousness of Christ in our mortal bodies. We don't want to fail that. And it puts a, an urgency in us, a desire to give diligence, be ready to go to battle, you know, uh, submit yourselves unto God, resist the devil, and... He will free, flee from you. You're going to want to know this pattern. It's going to start with a thought in your mind. It's going to appeal to you according to the lust, your want, your lust of the flesh. You know, Eve saw that the fruit was desired to make one wise as he had his interaction. I'm not going to go through the depth of that. Maybe that'll be another message someday. I have preached on it. But he was stirring up through the dialogue. See, she began to regard his counsels. Consider them, think about them, and soon, soon it began to produce a desire in her. Oh, that tree is a desire to make one wise. You elevate her status. Her, it became a want in her, and so that gave her a desire. A desire was produced in her through the counsel of Satan. You know, delight yourself in the Lord. Commune with Him, and He will give you the desires of your heart, not the desire to get things in life. He will give you the desire to give diligence. He will give you the desire to be holy. He will give you the desire to be pure. He will give you the desire that you'll want to overcome all sins and iniquity and see God glorified in your life. He'll give you the desire, the proper things that you should desire according to the will of God. Let's move down to uh, really what I was after was... Uh, down lower in the, uh, further on in that chapter. Okay, blessed is the man that endureth temptation, for when he is tried, he shall receive the crown of life, which the Lord hath promised to them that love him. Now when we're finished, and we're perfected in any given area, or perfected totally, what we have is we have a crown of life, a crown a crown is something a king wears. A king is the ruler. He is the dominion. He is the authority. He is the one in control. Now we have sin working in our members from the day of our birth. We have sin working in our members even after we receive the Holy Ghost. We are in an exercise of overcoming. So as I said before, at various stages as we go on to perfection, we are not actually fully in control of our bodies, are we? 
The good we would, we do not. The evil that we would not, that we do. And I know I keep going over that like a broken record. What does that mean? That means you. there's some good things that you want to do that you, you're not doing. There's still a mystery of iniquity. There's still a manifestation of sin in the flesh. So it means you are not the king of your vessel. Right? You try to take rule over your vessel, right? You try to say, like smoking, when I was smoking. I'm just, okay, him that defiles the temple, God will destroy, and, and I fear God, and that's the knowledge of God, and I fear God, and I want to honor God, so I'm not going to smoke anymore, but I'm addicted. My heart's all wounded, and it has all these wants for comfort, and I cannot resist the temptation to smoke for a while while I'm overcoming all of this. I go through a season where I'm battling it, and sometimes it gets the best of me, right? So I'm not the king of my vessel. Sin has a power over me. Sin has power over me. I need to somewhere down the line learn the truth. I need to have some kind of experience where I learn the truth. I need to come to a point of desperation and cry out to God. And I have to go through all that part of the operation of God until God sets me free. And make no mistake about it, I must overcome that. I cannot just keep continuing doing that all the rest of my life. I have to overcome it. So I'm not, I, I, don't, I don't have the crown. I am not the ruler of my own body. Where the word of the king is, there's power. And where the word of the king is, there's power. But when I overcome, God gives me the crown. He gives me the authority. Now you have rule over your will and your body and your spirit. Now it's up to you. We kicked sin out of there. Now what, what do they all do with their crowns in the book of Revelation? <laughs> Lay it back down to their feet. Remember I was saying last week about the will and the liberty Liberty, Christian liberty, is you are now at liberty to not sin anymore. As you have been embracing purity and holiness and were having trouble fulfilling it, now you're set free to live holy and righteous. Now you have the mastery. You have rule over your own spirit. You have dominion over your own being, spirit, soul, and body. You have the crown of life. Your will is free to, your will is free not to. Did you know, brothers, that to this very day right now as I speak to you, I have liberty to go out and smoke a cigarette. God isn't going to stop me. You're not going to stop me. If I will to smoke a cigarette, if I want to, if I want to go smoke a cigarette, I have been set free. I can go out and smoke a cigarette. Do I smoke it? No! Because God gave me the liberty not to take up my life, as I said last week. God gave me the liberty so that I have the opportunity to show worship and lay it down again. Right? I'm not under the law. Thou shalt not smoke. I'm not under that law. Does that mean I smoke? No. Does that mean if I smoke, there'll be an evil consequence? Yes. <laughs> you see? See how the liberty works there? It's just, we talked about that last week. All right. Well, let's get into this, this thing before I get too far off track. I'm... So, blessed is the man that endures temptation. When he is tried, he will receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised to them that love him. You see, we got to be tried like this. Because when God brings us into eternity, we're being delivered into the glorious liberty of the sons of God. We're going to go into heaven with liberty. God's not going to impose anything on us from without. He's not going to have no uh, anything kind of like a written law or anything like that. He's not. We're going to be in the liberty of the sons of God. You're at liberty do as thou wilt, right? <laughs> but whatever you will must be the will of God. And God knows by the time we're perfect, we'll be such creatures of understanding. We have tasted the sentence of death. We know the, the horrible, destructive consequences of sin and iniquity, that even though we're at liberty to do that, God knows that of our own accord, we won't do that. We will honor God. We'll worship God. All right, the crown of life, which the Lord hath promised them that love him. Now, here we go. Let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God. For God cannot be tempted with evil. So you can't play reverse psychology on him. He's too smart for that. 
God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. So God doesn't tempt any man? So God doesn't play reverse psychology on anybody else, does he? I mean, Jesus isn't sitting in the background saying, boy, I, I would really like my reputation to spread far and wide and be a very important son of God amongst the people and have everybody notice how great I am. So, uh, And I know that the nature of man is rebellion to do opposite of what he tells. So I'll tell this guy, don't tell anybody that I healed you, and he'll go out and noise it all abroad. <laughs> you think Jesus did that? No, <laughs> Jesus didn't do that. Jesus genuinely was a man who made himself of no. no reputation. He didn't say, make sure you don't tell anybody, because he, didn't, he wasn't seeking a reputation. So he did that sincerely. And the other thing is, there's no, I've said this before, no Christian does something to deliberately stir up a motion of evil out of his brother. No Christian does that. No preacher does that. No man of God does that. Paul didn't do it. Jesus didn't do it. God doesn't do it. God tempts no man. Well, why did you do that? Well, I, I wanted to just prove that you're going to show out. How many people know I did that on purpose to, so I could provoke them to show out so you could see? No. Nope. You know what? God never does that. Right. Never. Never. God never does that. God does not tempt man with evil. God does not provoke evil out of man. Never, ever. God doesn't do it. His Spirit doesn't do it. Jesus doesn't do it. Paul doesn't do it. And neither do any of his ministers. Any, anything you do like that is antichrist. It's, it's ungodly. Right. Every man is tempted when he is drawn of his own, own lust. And that's what we have to escape. The corruption in the world through... Lust. So when God's going to tempt you, He's going to tempt you. He's going to let you be tempted on the basis of your own lust. And then after you are tempted in lust, if you regard the iniquity or the uh, dialogue of Satan, if you will, as he tries to tempt you, bring thoughts into your mind, you become enticed, intrigued by the idea. Say, this is actually a possibility. I might be able to partake of this pleasure. And just think, I could do it in secret when my brothers aren't looking. I, I'll probably get away with it. No one will ever know. Why? Maybe I could, uh, you know, crawl in bed with this woman over here. Why? I, I, after all, I'm taking a trip to Canada. What, what, what would you guys know, right? I mean, I'm 600 miles away from you, right? Yeah. Maybe, maybe I could just sneak one in. And of course, uh, you know, God is a gracious and merciful God. He'll forgive me, right? Okay, well, how far do you want to go down that road? And the more you think about it, the more you get enticed and sure. thinking, well, maybe I could work this out after all. You know, doesn't that, wouldn't it feel good? And wouldn't it take a real load off my heavy burden? And uh, gee, isn't that the comfort I've been looking for? And of course it's not, right? But you see, that's enticed, enticed. You start uh, entreating it and, and musing on the possibilities of things. And then you begin to regard iniquity in your heart. So I am tempted. No man is tempted of God. God cannot be tempted with evil. Neither tempted, the en tempted he any man. But every man is tempted when he is drawn of his own lust and enticed. Here we go. And I know we've preached this before, but here we go. Then when lust hath conceived... Lust conceives your desire for a particular action or a particular thing. It conceives. It finds a resting place in your heart because you were enticed. You gave regard to it. Now you're considering the possibility of pulling it off and it, it, and it gets a place in your heart, right? The counsel is the word. The word is the seed. The seed enters in. It appeals to your lust. Your lust wants something. The council is introducing to you the possibility of obtaining that lust. You're enticed by it. You regard it. You enter into the dialogue, if you will. You play with the thoughts. You give it consideration. And all of a sudden, yes, I want this. It conceives. You accept it. You receive it. 
and then you want it. So, lust, it conceives. And when it conceives, what does it produce? It produces a spirit. It produces a spirit. And the more you believe you could pull this off, or the more you believe in the possibility of this happening, the more you believe the lie that this is the thing you want, when really it's not what your soul wants, but the more you believe that lie... The more you allow it to roll around again and again and again, and each time it's picking up speed, it's picking up power, it's <clears throat> picking up substance or so, la, ungodly substance, if you will. It's, it's picking up growth. It's getting larger, bigger, faster, more powerful. It's a spiritual motion. And it's like that char. Now all of a sudden, now if you just try to resist it now, you won't be able to because it's got so much force and power. Yeah. It's going to bust past your will. When lust has conceived, it brings forth sin. Sin is a spirit. It's a spirit. A spirit of greed. A spirit of lust. A spirit of envy. A spirit of hate. A spirit of anger. A spirit of murder. A, a spirit of blasphemy. A spirit of pride. It's gaining a momentum. Because it's conceived. Because you were enticed and gave it too much place. This is why we're saying, this is our battle. Take every thought. This, this is our part of the warfare. Yeah, I can't produce my own righteousness. But I can identify a thought that has been presented, and I can go to war. I can take it captive. Hey, brother, I have a thought that a woman comes into the room, wants to go to bed with me. I can take that thought captive and in my thoughts I can preach to her. She falls on her face and she repents and puts her clothes back on and gets saved. Right? So much for that. See what I mean? You can take a thought captive. Yeah, finish it in a godly fashion. Resist it. Go to war. This is what we're saying. There's, it's God who trains my hands for battle. My arms can bend a bow of bronze. You know, by wise counsel, make your warfare. So, and to do that, you need the true knowledge of God, the true counsel of God, to countervail and reprove the lying counsels that are trying to sear your conscience, to try to get lust to conceive. So you got lust. You got a counsel of the devil. The lust, you're enticed. The lust conceives. It brings forth a spiritual motion. The spiritual motion busts forth, comes into your flesh, and when it comes into your flesh, it produces the deed, and when the sin... It brings forth sin, and then when sin is finished, it brings forth, for the wages of sin is... And what does he say? Do not err, my beloved brethren. So what's the error? Is the error not believing your sins are forgiven after you commit the sin? Is that what your error is? The error of unbelief and not believing in grace and forgiveness after you've committed the act? No, not in this context. In this context, do not err means don't let that process go on. And the, the best way or probably the only way you can really do that is at the level of thought. At the level of thought, at the level of temptation. And as we've heard, temptation is not necessarily sin. Temptation isn't sin. It's what you do with it. You know, if I regard the temptation of iniquity, if I regard it, if I'm enticed by it. All right, so you see that. Every good and gift, perfect, every perfect gift is from above and cometh down from the Father of lights with, who, with whom is no variableness, and neither shadow of turning. Of his own will begat he us with the word of truth that we should be kind of first fruits of his creatures. Wherefore, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath, for the wrath of man worketh not the righteousness of God. A good counsel in general, not to be too rash or desperate or quick to do anything because uh, you want to give wisdom a place. Right? So don't, don't be swift to come to conclusions about things, especially you know the subtlety of the devil. And that's something I'm trying to exercise myself in terms of my own mind and concerning everything that I hear out there about the state of the church and the state of people and the state of other things. I'm slowing down. I'm slowing down. I'm slowing down. And that's not to 
hold any charge against anybody in particular. It's just that, remember, uh, Jesus didn't have uh, issues against man, but Jesus didn't have any need and any testify of man because he knew what was in man. He knows sin is in man. Well, we know that sin is at work trying to do things, and we know we're at various uh, stages of perfection and imperfection, and so you want to take that into account. Now, you don't want to think evil of your brother or anything like that, but you just want to just realize, be slow with that stuff. All right, so where, wherefore, and you've heard me quote this scripture all many numerous times, wherefore, lay apart all filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness. You know, a certain amount of naughtiness is, is inevitable. You have to just resign yourself to the fact that we're going to see certain manifestations of sin as people stumble and all of that. We know that in the eternal purpose of God, uh, God made man to experience sin and consequences to do a job of writing something on the tables of his heart to produce experiences that motivate him to holiness and purity through the consequences of sin. And part of that is a necessity, but as I said before, there is a certain amount of sin that's practiced that's above and beyond what is necessary to give grace its opportunity, to give forgiveness its opportunity. You know, you have to sin. If you don't sin, then what are you forgiven from, right? Obviously. I mean, it's this simple sort of fundamental idea. But yet you can, you can take that idea and pervert it to such a, a degree that there's so much sin being committed. Don't tell me that that's, God wants that much sin committed or that it can take that kind of liberty of, of being committed. And that's what James is saying here. Lay apart all filthiness and excess of naughtiness and filthiness and evil deeds receive with meekness the engrafted word which is able to save your souls be ye not doers of uh, be ye doers of the word and not hearers only deceiving your own selves doers of the word what what word would that be that would be the word of all holiness and purity and righteousness and the divine nature Operating in you. If any be a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man beholding his natural face in the glass, for he beholdeth himself and goes his way and straightway forgets what manner of man he was. Well, isn't that like Catholic confession? <laughs> you, you, you do a sin and you confess, Father, I have sinned, I've done such and such and so and so, and you walk away, just forget what manner of man you are and just go out and do it again. You, you have to be a doer of the word. You have to be a doer of this work. Whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty and continueth therein. If you pursue this until you finally overcome. He being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. If any of man among you seems to be religious and broadleth not his tongue, but deceiveth his own heart, this man's religion is vain. Pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is this, to visit the fatherless and widows in their affliction and to keep himself unspotted, undefiled, unspotted from the world. To defile something is to violate the purity of. So tell me then, is it important to achieve purity of heart? Then after that, is it important to achieve purity of flesh? Holiness of flesh and spirit, it is. And then we uh, was re we were reading the scripture, and this is, uh, I'll read it again. So what defiles a man? It's not what's coming in. And I know Jesus says this in reference to eating meat, like food. You know, all your disciples eat with unwashing hands, defiled hands. Oh, oh, oh. And Jesus said, well, it's... Uh, Hearken unto me, every one of you, and understand, there's nothing from without a man entering in can defile him, but the things which come out of him, those are they that defile the man. Because Jesus is spiritualizing, spiritualizing this, even though the issue begins with eating with physically dirty hands, you know, spiritualize it. There's no experience that yet comes at you that can defile you. What's going to defile you is your reaction to it, what comes out in a reaction to the experience, right? So we can be, people can offend us, and if what comes out of us is bitterness, then we will become defiled by what comes out of us. 
And this is the importance of maintaining uh, purity of spirit, purity of mind, understanding that we're called to temptation. We are called to have people slander and speak evil of us as they seek to protect their own sinful agendas and try to save face while also loving to commit their sin at the same times. And to, in order for them to try to pull that off, well, they got to malign everybody else and make them look bad. And they got to use a bunch of slanders and lies to do it. And so we have to realize this is part of the cup of sufferings. This is suffering reproach because we stood for true holiness and purity and righteousness. And and not not just on a whim, but we, we're, we're giving you a whole in-depth description, doctrinal reasons and everything else, and the description of the operation of God. You know, we're not, this is not a pretense to us. This is not a pretense. And so you have to eat and drink worthily. We're eating and drinking the cup of the Lord. We're eating and drinking his sufferings when people slander us and lie, and then our character is maligned and... We're being accused of saying things we didn't say. We're our intention. We're, we're we're being accused of being against people. We're not against. We're being accused of doing actions and deeds that we did not do, and so on and so forth. Well, we're eating and drinking. If you suffer for reproach for the name of Christ, happy, happy are you? And we eat and drink worthily. We we thank God that we're counted worthy to be tested in this way. And what are we being tested? Are we going to take our own vengeance? Are we going to rise up? Are we going to try to defend our own characters and all of that stuff? Are we going to take vengeance into our own hands and revile again? again? Is that what we're going to do? My prayer, though, I mean, and as I said before, everybody would like to be vindicated, right? Right. Everybody would like to be vindicated. So I pray, God, vindicate us. Mm -hmm. Eventually, let it come to pass that it's manifest what our real intentions are, the purity and the real reasons why we're doing the things we do. Amen. Let it be manifest. Let, let God vindicate us mm-hmm. to the consciences of other people who are thinking evil of us in an evil way. Mm-hmm. And I also pray uh, from time to time, uh, you know, God do this. And sometimes I say, how long, O oh Lord? How long? But, but do this so that we, in our lack of patience, don't put forth our hand to iniquity to try to make it happen. Okay. So that's a delicate balance. I mean, you want to defend your position of righteousness, right? You want to be vindicated and all of that? Well, seek the Lord. That's why we got to give diligence and got to keep our heart. Keep your heart with all diligence because issues are going to come out of there. It's going to come out. So you got to keep your heart. Well, how do I keep my heart? Well, the best way is take that thought captive before it gets planted in there. And amongst ourselves, yeah, let's let's confess our faults. Let's have fervent charity. Confess our faults so that we can be healed. Let's work out this healing of our souls. If your soul is healed, if your heart is sound, a sound heart is the life of the flesh, and with a sound heart becomes comes the strength to bear, the strength to endure. With a sound heart comes root in yourself, contentment with what's going on, good or evil, because I have a security and a resting place and a root in myself with God. He talks to me, I talk to him, the Holy Ghost gives me confirmation. His visitation preserves my spirit, like like Job said. And, I, and I'm good with that. So slander away, I don't care, say what you want. Well, it's easier said than done, but see, this is this is the goal. And this is how we sustain and keep ourselves, keep your heart with all diligence, because that's where the issues are going to come out of. They're going to come out, they're going to come into your flesh. See, the whole thing is one whole long sweeping process where the deeds of the flesh and the lust of the flesh came from a spiritual issue in your heart. The fleshly lust is at war against your soul. You cannot divide them and say... This is one thing and that's another. The deed's one the deed is nothing, but it's the issue of your heart that God's looking at. It's all the same thing. It's all the same continuing motion. <laughs> if you think of it any other way, you're in Matthew 23, you're the Pharisees, you fool, you blind. The action and deed of, of the flesh that is sin, or sins, if you want to call it sins, those actions and deeds are 
inexplicably un, unable to be separated from the spiritual motion which came out of your heart, which evil thing was released into your flesh because somewhere you don't believe something about God. Unbelief. Every sinful act is because of unbelief, preceded by unbelief. Every, every one, every single one, every single one. God's given us all things that pertain, all things that pertain to life and godliness. The grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us denying ungodliness and worldly lust, worldly lusts, ungodliness. What is ungodliness? Any action or deed that is not pure and holy. Denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, godly, not when Jesus comes a second time, in this present world. There's your mark. Again, there's your mark. We're going to keep holding it up. No, we are not purveyors and promoters of self-works or self-righteousness at all. We are embracing the holiness of God and we're going for it. We know how important it is. The altar sanctifies the gift. You know that your exercise, your practice of diligence, your spiritual exercise, you, you seeking the Lord, you working it out, you going to war against the evil thoughts of Satan in your mind and spirit, you doing all of that, you are seeking to separate the motions of God that are in you so it, it can be allowed to come out into your body. You are diligently giving every effort, knowing the fear of God, the importance of this whole way of glorifying God, you're, you're doing it all, you, are, you will have, we have the responsibility of sanctifying our bodies so this gift can come out and express, our, express itself in our flesh. That exercise is our part. The altar sanctifies the gift. The temple sanctifies the gold. So if I'm going to see Christ in, in, in you, What's the most important thing for me to see Christ in you? Is it the Holy Ghost? No, because I have the Holy Ghost. And you have the Holy Ghost. But if I want to see Christ, if I want to see it, I mean, I want, I want him to shake my hand. I want him to say, God bless you, brother. Be encouraged. Or I want him to hear him say, hey, brother, you should be careful. You shouldn't be doing thinking that. If I want Christ to express, communicate, if I want to see him, touch him, feel him, hear him, talk to him, the most important thing is the altar, the flesh. The most important thing is the flesh and the altar. So why do you sanctify? You tell me, is the, off, is the flesh set apart to express the image of Jesus Christ when it's committing actions and deeds of sin? Of course it's not. So it's not an issue of deeds of the flesh or sins of the flesh. It's unsanctification. It's your temple is worshiping Satan. By their fruits, by their deeds, by their actions, they, you shall know them. All right, that's it. I'm done. Praise the Lord.